Hello, and welcome back to our first notes section on Unit 3, Biological Psychology. So we just finished up Units 1 and 2 um, of History Approaches and Research, which we're going to use going forward. And we'll talk about some of those approaches in biological psych, evolutionary, biopsychosocial, um, the biological perspective, um, even a little bit of behavioral genetics, things like that. So it's good to have a foundation that we got from Units 1 and 2. This unit is going to be a lot of new information for many of you. A lot of new vocab terms. If you've never taken an anatomy class or haven't done any brain studying, it's going to be a lot of new things. So we have to be ready for that. Um, take your time, please. I encourage you during these videos to pause them, go back, re-listen to sections that you don't quite get, and go over them. Great opportunities to use your, your uh, reading guides as well. They can help clarify things as you go. So we're going to jump right in to our first section, which is all about the neuron and neural functioning in our brain and how that works. So to break things down first, we're going to go through the parts of a neuron, which will be responsible for understanding what each part of the neuron does and how it communicates with other neurons in the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. So at the top, um, these little branches, we have dendrites. These receive incoming messages from other neurons. So those are the receptors that they receive messages. As they receive those messages, they send that message down to the cell body or the soma, which contains the nucleus. Like we just said, the nucleus inside the cell body, if the message that it receives stimulates the neuron enough, it will make the decision to fire or not fire, right? If it reaches the absolute threshold, it will fire a message down the neuron. We'll discuss how that happens. So you have the dendrites receive the message, cell body, which contains the nucleus, then it decides to continue that message or not based on how stimulating it is. You have myelin sheath, which are these little yellow uh, marshmallow looking things. They're fatty tissue that insulates the axon and speeds up the rate of transmission. This is what it looks like. This axon, you can think of as this band here and around it is the myelin sheath. It just insulates it and it allows the electrochemical signal to transmit faster and more efficiently the way it should be. As it continues down, in between the myelin sheath are these little gaps called the node of Ranvier, or Ranvier. That's just a space between the myelin sheath. It allows the electrochemical signals to jump and, it, and facilitates the speed of transmission. The axon, is the entire, the orange here, this entire line underneath the myelin sheath. It runs the entire length of the neuron, right? It's the longest part of the neuron through which the electrochemical message travels. Um, it is insulated by the myelin sheath. And this is an electrochemical message because it is kind of like an electrical signal being sent. Um, but the things that are being received and sent when we get to the ends here, are chemical messengers that we'll talk about. So that's our axon. You have Schwann cells, which are these little dots in the center of your myelin sheath. That helps generate myelin sheath uh, and keep it fresh and keep it thick in the way it needs to be to protect the axon and to facilitate the transmission. At the very end, you have axon terminals or axon terminal buds, these little dots here at the end of the neuron. Once the message reaches this, it is the endpoint, and from these buds, the neuron releases something called neurotransmitters um, into the synapse, which then sends the message on to the next neuron. And that's how our brain communicates with the rest of our body and itself. Um, it passes messages from neuron in through the dendrites, out through the axon terminals to the next neuron. And the message continues until it takes care of what it needed to do. So that is the basic structure of a neuron and the parts and pieces. We'll do some things in class to help um, make that stick as well. So there's some pieces to this message sending that neurons do that we need to talk about. So when a neuron is in its resting potential, that's the electrical charge of the axon in its inactive state. When the neuron is ready to fire, but it has, no, it has not received a message and it has no message to send. The inside of the cell is negative relative to the outside of the axon. 
So inside you have potassium ions, which is a negative charged axon, and outside are sodium ions. These are electrolytes you may have heard of, Gatorade commercials, things like that help replenish your electrolytes after activity. It just helps facilitate um, your muscle movement and things like that because these neurons need those electrolytes to be able to send their messages. So we have potassium inside and sodium outside. This means that the, the neuron is something called polarized when opposite charges are away from each other. We have a negative charge inside of the neuron, inside of the axon, and a positive charge outside. We're at resting potential, waiting to receive a message, waiting to fire. The typical neuron receives hundreds of messages a day, right? If not thousands. Um, most of those messages are excitatory, telling the neuron to fire and send a message down the synapse or down the axon and out through the synapse. Um, some are also inhibitory, saying don't fire, don't complete this action. Uh, but when there are more excitatory than inhibitory messages coming in, that cell body will then exceed its threshold and it will create an electric pulse. Right? So that's how it knows when it's time to fire. There are more excitatory messages coming in, all these little E's at the dendrites, sending information to the cell body. And the nucleus says, okay, I've reached my threshold. I need to continue sending this message down the line to the next neuron and it fires. That is called an action potential. A nerve impulse that consists of a brief electrical charge that travels down the axon from the dendrites, down the axon, and eventually out the axon terminals. When an action potential occurs, a neuron fires with something called the all or nothing principle. Okay. When the stimulation of that nucleus exceeds the threshold, a neuron will fire. Um, and if it does not exceed the threshold, it will not. There is no half firing. There's no half measures. It's either it exceeds the threshold and it fires or it doesn't. Right. That's the all or nothing principle. Along the same vein, the strength of an action potential, potential remains the same throughout the length of the axon. It doesn't get weaker, it doesn't get stronger, it pushes down through the axon with the same strength and intensity every time. Right? And that connects directly to the all or nothing principle. If it's stimulated past the threshold, it will fire, and it will fire with the same intensity every time. If it's not stimulated past the absolute threshold, the neuron will not fire, there will be no intensity. Right? That's our action potential. When the action potential occurs, this is also called depolarization. Okay, so remember, when, an, when a neuron was polarized, we had negative charge here, positive charge here, they were separate, right? When depolarization occurs, those positive sodium ions enter the neuron and they make it more susceptible to fire an action potential, pushing out the sodium ions. So they mix and sodium um, comes in and potassium flows out. And that's what allows the message to be sent. And that's called depolarization. After depolarization occurs and a message is sent, uh, a neuron goes through something called the refra refractory period. After a neuron has fired, it pauses and is unable to fire again for a short period of time to recharge itself. At this time, sodium is going to come back in, or excuse me, sodium flows out and potassium makes its way back in to achieve resting potential. So when depolarization occurred, sodium flowed in and pushed potassium out. Now we're in the refractory period, and sodium has to come back in, excuse me, potassium has to come back in, and sodium is pushed out so that it can achieve resting potential again. Okay? Refractory period is a perfect example of psychology-specific definitions. Uh, if any of you have gotten to the vocab yet, that's why I tell you to use Alley Dog or the Quizlet, because if you just blindly Google refractory period, you're going to get something very different than you would compared to the psychological definition. Just a heads up. Okay, so here's a zoomed in example um, of depolarization happening. Stimulus arrives in these little receptors, right? The sodium channel opens and sodium ions rush in. They come in. Now we're mixing positively and negatively charged um, ions, and that leads to depolarization and the action potential. 
Once that occurs, potassium's, potassium rushes out, allowing it to be sent down the axon throughout the entire body of the neuron. Um, the first sodium channels close, but those further down the axon open, carrying the movement of depolarization along. And that process happens until it reaches the axon terminals, where it then can send the message on to the next neuron. A little bit other information about um, action potential. For you visual learners out there, sometimes it's nice to see a graph of what happens. Uh, and look at it that way. You could copy this down if you think that's helpful. At your resting potential, you're essentially flat. When depolarization occurs and the action potential begins, whew, there's a lot of action, right? Sodium moves into the axon, making it more positive inside. The message is passed. After the message reaches its peak, and we're coming down, re, something called repolarization begins to occur where potassium um, moves out of the axon, reestablishing the resting potential. And down here, this little dip, you can see, this is all part of the refractory period because in this section, the neuron would not be able to fire again, right? That's what the refractory period is, a time when you cannot um, fire or send another message or receive another message. Eventually we come back to resting potential and are ready to receive another message and fire again. Okay. Now, that seems like a lot of things happening and it is, it's a complex system, but transmitting that message, the length of the axon takes less than one hundredth of a second. Everything we do, neurons in our brain and in our nervous system are firing and communicating and sending images and sending messages. Um, it happens so quickly for our body to function and happens thousands and thousands of times uh, a day. So with each action potential, a small amount of sodium enters the cell and a small amount of potassium leaves it. To maintain the original balance of these elements, each portion of the axon has a sodium potassium pump that continuously moves sodium out of the cell and potassium into it, always trying to reach back to that resting potential to be ready to fire again um, when they receive the next message. So that was a lot of information about the basic structure of a neuron and how the message or action potential travels down the axon. Now, when it gets to the end in that place, um, the axon terminals, that's where it's going to send the message to another neuron. So it can continue the message and we can do whatever we need to do in our brain or in our body. However, when it gets to the axon terminals, let's say this hand is axon terminals. And this hand is the dendrites of the other neuron. They are not ever actually touching one another. There's the small little gap between them that we call the synapse. Okay, so neurons are not connected. They're just very, very, very close to each other. Um, and there's a tiny little gap between the axon terminals of the sending neuron and the dendrites of the receiving neuron. This tiny gap we can call the synapse or the synaptic gap or the synaptic cleft cleft. You might hear it as any of those three things. Okay. So here's a little image below of what the synapse looks like. And you can see here's one neuron, action potential, sending information down and pushes it out of the axon terminals, which are not touching the dendrites of the receiving neuron. There's a tiny little gap in between. So how do they make that message? How do they get that message across? Well, this is where the chemical part of the electrochemical message comes into play. There are tiny little molecules known as neurotransmitters. Okay? And there's little vesicles in each neuron that contain these neurotransmitters. And as the action potential makes its way and stimulates the neuron enough, it releases specific neurotransmitters to relay whatever message needs to be relayed. Okay? And these neurotransmitters cover the gap and they sit or connect to these little receptor sites. Right? And these receptor sites, you can kind of think of them as like keys in a lock. Only certain neurotransmitters can attach to certain receptor sites. And that's how neurons send messages and the appropriate messages across the synapse so that message can be continued to be carried from neuron to neuron. So let's talk a little bit more about those neurotransmitters. They're chemicals released from the sending neuron they travel across the synapse and bind to the receptor sites on the receiving neuron, thereby influencing it to generate 
and action potential, okay? So if these neurotransmitters, after they cross the synapse, they connect to the dendrite of another neuron in your brain, if they stimulate that neuron enough past the threshold, that neuron will continue the message um, and it will send it to the next one as well until the message is carried out. Okay, so just a zoomed in view of what we just saw. Now, when a neurotransmitter has finished sending its message, it will be released from the receptor site. And most often, most of the time, um, something called reuptake occurs, where those neuro neurotransmitters are then kind of sucked back up into the sending neuron. Okay? It basically has the effect of turning down the volume on the message being transmitted between neurons. Once the message has been sent, it, they don't need to hang around anymore. The message no longer needs to be sent. It's happened. So they are re-uptaked, if that's a word, um, back into the sending neuron. Um, once they've done their job, that's it. Right? That's usually what happens. Some neurotransmitters may escape and they eventually degrade and they can't be used anymore or enzymes change their structure and they can't be um, effective as neurotransmitters. But generally, reuptake occurs and they're brought back into the sending um, neuron and they can be reused for the next messages. Okay, so now we need to go over some important neurotransmitters that you should know. Okay, these are some of the classic ones that you'll hear about or are most likely to see um, in AP Psychology. So we have acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is most likely, or its primary roles are for learning, memory, and muscle contractions. So that's the neurotransmitter that will be sent when we're trying to build memory, we're trying to tell our muscles to contract or do certain things, or when we're learning. Each of these neurotransmitters also has associated disorders that can occur as a result of an undersupply or an oversupply or something like that. Um, so acetylcholine's associated disorders, most common disorder is Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is associated with an undersupply of acetylcholine, which makes sense. If acetylcholine is responsible for memory and muscle contractions, well, Alzheimer's disease is a, an inability to remember your memories, you lose your memories. Um, sometimes you lose muscle function and things like that because there's not enough acetylcholine in your brain um, and in your nervous system to continue doing those things. Our second is dopamine. Dopamine is involved with movement, thought processes, processes, and rewarding sensations. Um, an oversupply of dopamine is associated with schizophrenia, right? Oversupplying dopamine, your thought processes are a little overactive. Um, things like delusions and hallucinations can occur. Undersupply of dopamine, Parkinson's disease. It assists in movement. Parkinson's is that you start to shake and you lose kind of control of your movement. Um, and drug addiction, we'll get to opiates later on, but other drugs mimic um, dopamine and they can actually kind of impact your brain and cause it to produce less dopamine. So drug addiction can lead to an undersupply of dopamine, which is then why people become addicted to drugs because they want that rewarding sensation that dopamine provides and their brain isn't producing it. So they become addicted to it. So that's dopamine. Our next is serotonin. That's a neurotransmitter that helps us um, regulate our emotional states and our sleep. So an undersupply of this neurotransmitter can lead to depression, right? Problems with emotional states, problems with sleep can easily help lead to depression. Um, we'll talk about things called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs um, that our function is to prevent serotonin from being reuptake. So there's more of it in the synapse um, to help treat people with depression. Our next is norepinephrine um, or epinephrine is another one. The way you can say this, um, you might know it more commonly as adrenaline, and we'll get to that a little bit later in this unit, but it helps with physical arousal, learning, and memory. The associated disorders with that, undersupply, depression, oversupply, stress. Right? Your heart starts beating too much. You just feel that feeling of adrenaline and stress. 
with an oversupply of norepinephrine. As we continue, GABA or GABA um, helps inhibit our brain activity. So this is something we call an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Most of the ones we've discussed are excitatory, um, but this helps to slow down brain activity and slow down the messages that neurons are sending or eliminate some messages that neurons are sending. In this situation, an undersupply of GABA can lead to anxiety disorders. Your brain can't slow down. You're constantly thinking thoughts rushing through your mind. You can't seem to calm that in anxiety. Um, it could be due to an undersupply of GABA. And our final neurotransmitter is endorphins. These deal with pain perception and positive emotions. Um, pain perception wise, you may be familiar with something called the runner's high. You're able to run or compete in some type of physical endeavor without feeling pain until you're finished. Um, thanks to the endorphins you're experiencing. Something that mimics these endorphins are opiate addiction, heroin, Oxycontin, narcotics, those mimic your endorphins um, and they be you become addicted to them because of the positive emotions and pain relief associated with endorphins. So those are our major neurotransmitters. Um, these are ones that you're going to need to know and good to write down and keep in mind as we go forward, we're going to reference back to them as well. Just as an overview of how neurotransmitters work, we talked about this a little bit, but they bind to the receptors of the receiving neuron in kind of like a key lock mechanism. So this is our neurotransmitter mo molecule, and this is the receptor site. And you can see they fit perfectly together, right? Neurotransmitters attach to specific receptors like a puzzle piece fitting into its proper place. Um, receptors will only accept or recognize one type of neurotransmitter, okay? So dopamine is going to connect at a certain spot. Um, on the dendrites of a neuron, endorphins will connect somewhere else, and norepinephrine or whatever else we've discussed, acetylcholine, will connect in other areas. So they lock in just like that. Now, there are a couple things to consider um, when we're talking about how things might mimic neurotransmitters. Um, there are things called agonists which are similar enough in structure that it mimics the neurotransmitter's effect on the receiving neuron. So you can see here, it doesn't have the exact same structure, it's missing that little triangle, but it's close enough that it will still connect and stimulate that receptor site. A perfect example of an agonist, morphine, right? that's an opiate, which mimics endorphins by stimulating pain and mood receptors. Right? So opiate, we just talked about that on a couple slides ago. It's a perfect example of an agonist, which we can call like a master key, a key that fits into any lock um, and works, even though it's not necessarily designed for that specific lock. Okay. On the other hand, we have something called antagonists. These are similar enough to occupy the receptor site, but not similar enough to stimulate. It's only similar enough to block its action. Okay. So an antagonist, it fits, but it doesn't unlock, right? It's a false key. So it doesn't stimulate, it just blocks any other neurotransmitters from attaching to that site. Uh, for example, Botox is derived from the same microbe that causes botulism, which can lead to weakness and muscle paralysis. Uh, which neurotransmitter might it block or inhibit? Think about that for a second. Uh, can lead to weakness and muscle paralysis. Let's look back. Which neurotransmitter is involved in muscle contraction? Acetylcholine, right? So Botox connects to your neurons and blocks those cells in an attempt to paralyze your muscles so you don't get wrinkles, right? That's an antagonist. It does not allow neurotransmitters to send the message. Okay, and our last thing, um, which we just kind of touched on, is how can drugs influence neurotransmitter activity? They can do one of three things. They can be agonists, which we just said. They can mimic a neurotransmitter's effect, like heroin, morphine, or opium. They can be antagonists, meaning they can block the receptor site and not allow um, a neurotransmitter to take effect. For example, something called um, chlor... Fuck, 
for example, something called chlorpromazine and haloperidol, they are antagonists for dopamine. They block um, dopamine receptors. Okay. And last thing, they can also block reuptake to prolong the effect of certain neurotransmitters. That's where our SSRIs come in, or people with who experience depression may have selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors so that they can prolong the impact of serotonin and help alleviate those depression um, signs and symptoms. So this wraps up our basic intro into neurons, how neurons communicate, um, and what neurotransmitters do. That was a lot of new information, right? a lot of new terms you've never heard of before. Um, so please take your time, go back, read over things, look over things. If you need to re-listen to the entire video to, to make yourself feel comfortable, do that or ask me questions. I'm more than happy to talk about any of this stuff. Um, it's important. It's going to frame everything we do as we go through this unit. We're going to be talking about neurons and neural connections and everything that's involved with that. All right? So I hope you enjoyed. Have a great day. We'll see you in class.